On the 15th of April 1989, football fans headed to Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield to watch Liverpool play Nottingham Forest in the semi-final of the FA Cup. Semi-finals were always great occasions, you just did not want to lose a semi-final. Thousands of supporters converged on the stadium, expecting to see a great game between two exciting teams. Both my daughters just loved Liverpool, loved the team. Really passionate supporters. It was the one thing that we did as a family, and we loved it. Yet what was to happen at Hillsborough would change the face of football forever. On the 15th of April 1989, Liverpool Football Club were firm favourites as they prepared to face Nottingham Forest in the semi-final of the FA Cup. Liverpool fan Neil Fitzmorris was one of the many travelling to Hillsborough. I'm the youngest of four lads, all Reds, my dad's a Red and also of course I'm born and bred in Anfield. Beardley, McMahon, Nickel, Barnsley down the wing. It's just, it was just an incredible team. Another Liverpool fan travelling to the match that day was 14-year-old Philip Hammond. When we used to go to bed, Phil, and Liverpool were on te television, we used to have to set the, the camera up to video the television so we could watch it the next morning, you know. It was a really special side that expressed itself, perhaps more so than the Liverpool sides in, in the past or, or the future. Liverpool manager Kenny Dalgleish was the man responsible for this incredible team. They were also uh, very hard working and conscientious, which makes a difference. So they've been good players, but if you don't work your socks off, then there might not be too much in it for you, but they were magnificent. The match was to be played at Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield. Built in 1899, it had established itself as one of the top football grounds in the country. It had a, a great tradition, and... For semi-finals, the FA loved to use it because it was a, a massive ground. They could separate the fans either side and uh, police it very, very well. The match programme read, As you look around Hillsborough, you will appreciate why it has been regarded for so long as the perfect venue for all kinds of important matches. It is a stadium that befits such occasions and the large crowds that they attract. Today's game would see the stadium full to capacity with around 54,000 people expected for the match. The morning of a semi-final, it's, it's just that buzz again. Um, semi-finals were always great occasions, you just did not want to lose a semi-final. It was a big moment for me um, to think that we may get to an FA Cup final and I might be captain in an FA Cup final, maybe even walk up the steps in an FA Cup final um, as captain. We had a fantastic away following wherever we went anyway. So it was a ground that you look forward to playing in, because I think invariably not, we, we always used to do quite well there. There were two very good sides, evenly matched, and uh, on paper, I thought that uh, it was going to be a classic. Policing Hillsborough was a massive and complex operation. Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield was in overall command. It was his first time in charge of such a major football match. It was the task of Duckenfield and his officers to ensure that all the fans got safely into the stadium by three o'clock. Trevor and Jenny Hicks were there to watch the match that day with their two teenage daughters, Sarah and Vicky. We were all very excited because we were going to the FA Cup uh, semi-final at Hillsborough. It was a gorgeous sunny day and then we walked round to the ground. It was a big carnival day, everybody was happy. We'd been before, we'd been to that ground before. Hillsborough had two standing areas at opposite ends of the stadium. For this match, Nottingham Forest had been allocated the much bigger cop end, while Liverpool were given the smaller Leppings Lane end. Trevor and his daughters had standing tickets at the Leppings Lane end, whereas Jenny would be sat in the north stand. We split up just outside the turnstiles, Jenny went off to her seat. I think Vicky realised I was quite upset that I was going off to sit in the um, north stand on my own. And uh, she called my name and ran up to me and gave me an extra hug and a kiss. The girls and I went in and they always tried to dump me at about this point because obviously they had friends to see and they didn't want the old man hanging about. So they went off down the tunnel 
I went to get a coffee, forgetting the penning system, which meant that I was effectively separated from them by a fence. The Leppings Lane end at Hillsborough was split into five pens. Each pen was separated by perimeter fencing with an additional 10-foot high steel fence at the front. This meant that each pen had to be filled with a similar number of fans to avoid overcrowding. With less than an hour to go before kick-off, the players were preparing for the match. Alan Hansen and Ian Rush have been out for a while. Big Al had been out for a long time before he'd been injured in a, in a pre-season tournament in Spain. Gave him a shout to come and play. And we said, I've not played all year. I said, no, it's not a problem. We can play now. I'll take the responsibility. I remember sitting on the terrace reading my programme, listening to a tiny radio with, with a little earpiece in, waiting for the team selection. And there was a bit of a cheer, of course, when we found out that Hanson was going to be playing and, and that sort of thing. There was always a risk of overcrowding at Hillsborough. To avoid it, the previous year police had put in place a filtering system for fans arriving at the stadium. But not today. Today it was decided to let the fans find their own level. With half an hour to go before kickoff, a dangerous bottleneck had developed outside the ground. To make matters worse, some coaches were only just arriving into Sheffield. There was the feeling, I remember, when we got to Sheffield, of this, you know, we're later than we should have been. There was a lot of tailbacks, there was a lot of problems. We parked up the van, and by then there was, there was hordes of people getting down this road. It was the road that led into the Leppens Lane entrance. Inside the stadium, there were the first suspicions that something wasn't quite right at the Leppings Lane end. When I looked to the Leppings Lane terraces to see if I could see anything of Trevor and the girls, that was quite full, especially in the middle bit. Once through the turnstiles, fans found themselves in a concourse and facing a tunnel that led into the central pens. Many were unaware that there were also entrances which led into the much emptier side pens. A few people were reporting around us how few people there seemed to be in our bit. Um, I was sitting just below the police control box, literally the steps up to it were, you know, if you like, I could almost touch them. So we were sitting there and we think, it's getting a bit busy in there, and, but there was tons of room where we were. Chief Superintendent Duckenfield and his deputy, Superintendent Murray, were monitoring the situation on CCTV. We got to where it was really kind of congested, down in front of the, uh, the Leppens Lane turnstiles. There was this build-up and people were, were pushing to get through these turnstiles and then there was a kind of feeling of unease. A crush had now developed at the turnstiles with fans struggling to get into the stadium for the match. I can remember looking at this police horse and... You know, people were getting knocked by the horses they were going past. The fans were now seriously at risk. An officer outside the ground radioed through to Chief Superintendent Duckenfield and requested that an exit gate be opened to relieve the pressure on the turnstiles. Duckenfield gave the order, open the gate. But the tunnel was not closed off by police. Fans were not filtered into the emptier side pens. And as a further 2,000 fans entered the stadium, Many headed straight into the already packed central pens. As kickoff approached, the worst disaster in the history of British sport was unfolding on the terraces. The 1989 FA Cup semi final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest at Hillsborough was all set to be another classic encounter. But a crush had developed outside the stadium, and with eight minutes to go before kickoff, Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield had ordered the opening of an exit gate to relieve the pressure. It was a fatal decision. The gate got opened. There was never any obvious signs that you could go up and round the other pens. The only way that I, I presumed you got into the ground was down this tunnel. The tunnel leading to the already packed central pens was not closed off and many fans headed straight into a disaster. I started going down the tunnel and, and I can always remember it being really dim. There was no light and there was one bulb, I think. It's a really dark brick wall kind of tunnel. This kid who was on the minibus, with his, he was getting scraped along the wall. It was going too fast for him. And I can remember somehow being able to f get my way across to that side of the wall 
and, and he was helped away from the wall. And I just felt this surge behind me and it literally swept me towards the last 10 feet of this tunnel. And it was a sensation I'd never felt before or since. Trevor Hicks was stood in one of the emptier side pens and was fearing for the safety of his two daughters who were in the packed central pens. It became clear that there were problems in the inner pen and we were all getting very agitated. I remember saying to this policeman, can't you do something about it? And he said, shut your effing prattle. We knew what was going on, but they didn't. We knew something really, really bad was happening. But the police weren't getting it. They just weren't getting it. Jenny Hicks was sat in the North Stand and was growing increasingly concerned for the welfare of her family. I think when you go to lots of games, you can look at a crowd and know when something's not right. And I looked there and I thought, this isn't right. I turned to, to, to go out the tunnel. I couldn't move from the, from the, from the neck down. I was completely paralysed. And that was the first sense of, of horror. It's been a source of some discomfiture at Anfield that Nottingham Forest have been given 6,000 more tickets than Liverpool for this game and the Forest fans are packed into the cop on my right-hand side. As the game began, Liverpool fans were caught in a fatal crush on the terraces. I didn't really see the kick-off because my concern was what was going on on those terraces. You know, I had my children and, and, and my husband were in there. People panicking, people screaming, because you suddenly got no control. If you lost your footing, then you were going under. I mean, the only thing stopping you from going under was the fact that there was no room to fall. But if you happened to stumble as a, as a pocket of air opened, you were gone. There were people saying to me, Bruce, can you help? Because their faces were pinned against the fence. We can't breathe. So I said to the, the policewoman, please open the, the gate. And she said, well, we can't, we, we could have to wait in for our boss to, to give the, the word. I ran toward the referee and I pointed at the, the, the back of the goal. At six minutes past three, the police stepped in and stopped the match. The police inspector came on, touched me on the shoulder and sort of said, you know, we've got some problems. Um, could you get the players from the field of play? Referee come to me straight away as captain and he said, take the lads to the, to the, to the side of the pitch, take them off the pitch. A guy came up to me who I knew and he said, people are dying. Something has gone badly wrong at that end of the ground where the Liverpool supporters are. The game has been stopped, nothing is happening. The players are moving towards the centre circle. My hand got forced at the side of me and a guy next to me in one of the little pockets of air lifted himself up. Now in doing so, he stuck his elbow in my throat. One minute there was this so-called football match going on and the next thing there were people laying out and, and police and crowds and, and it was just... Horrible. It was getting so restricted that uh, the breath was just basically getting, getting pushed out of your lungs. I started getting the green, this green kind of haze around my eyes and I knew that it was, that there wasn't a lot left. FA Chief Executive Graham Kelly went to the police control box to ask what was going on. Chief Superintendent Duckenfield told Kelly that fans had forced a gate, causing the crush on the terraces. I saw Victoria uh, being passed over and handled out through the gate onto the pitch. And there was this policewoman who was stopping everybody getting out and basically pushed me away past her. Lo and behold, they're almost side by side, Sarah and Victoria, on the pitch. As I've said before, there are too many spectators in the central area right behind the goal where the Liverpool supporters are. All the players are now going off the field and it's a very sad start indeed to this semi-final, I'm afraid to say. Kenny Dalglish trooping off the field. The police come in and say there's been a bit of a problem at, at the Leppings Lane end. And we sat in there and the ref come in and said, oh, we maybe we went back out, but we'll stay in here for a moment. Knowing that you had family, I, I had my uh, family got at the game and, and uh, you were just worried and concerned for everybody. Uh, that was part of your life, you know? You could hear people going in and out by the corridor, supporters shouting and screaming and then 
and then Kenny popped his head out and I was running with someone shouting, uh, there's, there's people dying out there. A couple of us got this guy who was next to us. We dragged him across and, and, and we got him, we got over what we could. We were you know, standing on things that you don't want to think about. And we got there and some people were climbing up and over the top and we lifted this guy. Someone lifted his feet and someone lifted him by the hips and I had the shoulder part of it. And as we lifted him up to this fence, um, we just sort of shouted to him, just get up, get onto your feet and drop down and get on the pitch. But when we let go of him, he, I, I don't, he presumably he was dead already because he just hit the floor, you know, and, and I think the sight of him just thumping to the floor was just, that was it. I did a deal with God. I'm not a religious person, but I said, get me out of this and I'll do whatever you want, just get me out. Well, now, just before we go back to the snooker, I'm going to go uh, lead you to Gerald Sinistat at uh, Hillsborough, where Liverpool are playing in Nottingham Forest. I think it was snooker that was on, you know, and he broke into snooker, said it was trouble at um, Hillsborough. And I just looked and I was looking at it and I, you get a good feeling, you know what I mean? You just, you, you just think that's not a um, violence, there's something happening there, you know. The Hammond's 14-year-old son, Philip, had gone to Hillsborough with friends. When they came on a bit fair then saying, you know, there's um, injuries and all that, I just phoned Elder and said, look, there's, there's trouble at Hillsborough. And she just said, I'm coming home, I'm coming home. It's a very serious situation here indeed at Hillsborough. I was very aware of what, what you were then standing on, which wasn't a floor anymore, you know. Um, and it was, you know, it was just, it was just by the grace of God and surviving and trying to get out. My first indication was seeing people above my eye level, sort of scrambling to get to the, to the railings. So I climbed on the barrier, climbed on the fence, climbed onto the steps and then ran out onto the pitch. It was just pandemonium, it was absolute chaos. I just collapsed, it was just a relief thing, I think. I just sort of, I didn't collapse unconscious, but I fell to the ground and I was, I can remember lying on the ground and looking up and then I had this kind of weird, kind of shut off. I could see the sky, the blue, lovely blue sky. I could feel the heat of the sun and everything just filtered away, all the sound filtered away. And, and it was, I can remember looking at it and looking at it and thinking, this can't be happening on a day like this. Not, it's such a lovely day, you know. And then it all just zapped back in. And, you know, then it was become apparent the hell that was going on. The advertising hoardings are being used to ferry people across the field and people don't... I then just tried to um, to do what I could for people on the floor and stuff. Fans were ripping advertising hoardings up and using them as stretches. They were getting the coats, they were taking coats off, spinning them like a towel, like you flick a towel. And they were using three or four to a man to carry off bodies. Trevor Hicks was about to be forced into a decision that no father should have to make. I was actually kneeling down doing mouth to mouth on Sarah when the St John's ambulance came on the pitch and stopped probably five or ten yards away from us. So we picked Vicky up and we put her in the ambulance. And in that short time, we didn't even be able to get on and turn around because um, other people were being put on the floor of the ambulance. And so it was a case of, you know, I went to the back of the ambulance ready to get off to get Sarah. As we literally stood onto the pitch, the ambulance was full. And I left with this awful dilemma. Do I get back on the ambulance and go with Vicky and leave Sarah alone? Or do I go and look after her on the basis that, you know, Vicky's in the ambulance? And, um, well, if there's a low point in your life, that's it, I think. So I decided I would go with Victoria, uh, as the guy on the ambulance couldn't look after everybody. So, and we just assumed that all the other casualties would be dealt with in a similar way, that a fleet of ambulances would follow this one, and that sometime later Sarah would end up, you know, being brought to hospital along with all the other casualties. 42 more ambulances arrived at the stadium, but never made it inside. The disaster had been reported by some as crowd trouble, not crushing. The policemen's come up and asked Cloughy and I to go and make an announcement for the police, uh, police room. So we walked through the kitchens and everything. And there was football scores on the radio, but it wasn't really relevant. And we walked up to the, to the police room, went up the steps and the microphone wasn't working. Um, McCloughy said, oh, 
I'm off. So I said, well, I said there's a DJ's room down below. Um, does that work? So we went to the where they, they play the music and everything, and the announcer went into his room. And he asked us just to ask the people, you know, there's been a bit of a problem, look, like, please stay calm and help the police as much as you possibly can. And, and as I say, that there was, the punters were superb. I mean, they helped the police as much as, as anything else. Uh, to get, I mean, it, it was their friends, it, it was their supporters, it was their football club that was, that was in trouble. We, we were told that, you know, there, there's fatalities. What? You know, to what extent, you know, one, two, three, four. Uh, so we jumped in the shower, we just didn't, no one knew what to say, what to do. And we went up into the uh, the players' bar where we, we were congregated the the, the the team and and they had grandstand on and, and it was just unfolding in front of our eyes as I said before and John Matson was commenting saying you know if the death toll rose to thirty and what what what's this all about it was like a bad dream the fans who were mercifully not injured have left the ground most of them and. I have to report, we believe there are in excess of 20 fatalities. As the death toll rose, fans leaving the stadium were shell-shocked. The queues for phone boxes were just ridiculous. I and mean, people were in shock. I mean, if you've got your wits about you and you stand in a queue that's over a thousand foot long or whatever, you know you, there's no point in going to that phone box. But people were just standing there. I made my way to the newsagent's doorway where I'd arranged uh, to meet my children and Trevor. Um, and I can remember standing there and all these crowds and crowds and crowds were coming out. And you're looking through these crowds of people and the only three people you want to see were Sarah and Vicky and Trevor and but I was still hoping, I was still hoping that they were okay. Um, and then the crowd got thinner and thinner and then and eventually nobody came. The Northern General Hospital in Sheffield was now being overwhelmed with the arrival of many seriously injured Liverpool supporters. We took Victoria in and we put her in a cubicle in the emergency section and I stayed with her a little while but then they asked me to go outside and then it was a youngish police officer who came and gave me the bad news that Vicky had died. The events at Hillsborough had left many dead and hundreds injured. What should have been one of the highlights of the football season had turned into a disaster. I don't remember much of the journey going back, I must admit. It, it, it was so soul-destroying and, and, and sombre that nobody spoke. You obviously, you knew that you, possibly your members of your family, I think my brother had gone. Uh, so you're trying to get in touch but with your mother and father to see, make sure he's rang home to say he's all right. And but obviously, and you knew that your friend's there and there's other people who you knew. So your mind starts playing all kinds of tricks on you, to be honest, and, and fortunately, you know, my brother was one of the lucky ones. Got home and um, you watch the telly, you know, trying to think, think about things, and so, yeah, no, I'm, you know, it really makes makes a lot for me to, to, to be emotional, but, but I have to say that night, it, uh, you know, I mean, it was inconsolable, really, it was, it was unbelievable, you know. Thankfully, you know, my wife was there to just just broke down. Just couldn't help myself, you know. When, when you realise the enormity of what had gone on. Imagine you're sitting watching that on television. And they went straight, seemingly they went straight to it. Uh, when they started, they realised what was going on. Um, and you're sitting at home watching it and you're, you're, your family's at the game. At least we were at... We were at the scene, we could find it in a matter of minutes if everybody was okay. But they're sitting at home wondering and worrying and every time the phone rang, they, you can imagine the, the kind of state that the, the families would have been in.
The Hammonds were one of those families waiting for news, and they were growing increasingly concerned for the welfare of their son, Philip. We, we were just shattered. We didn't know what to do, you know what I mean? It's just one of these, one of these things, you just don't know what to do. So we just phoned the coach company who, who we went with. We said, look, um, can you give us any news about my son? He went, went in there and one of your coaches. She said, just hold on. She came back and said, yeah, you're okay. The coaches that we sent are full. They're coming out, they're on their way home. So we just sat, sat back, relaxed, thinking he's on his way home, you know, thank God, you know. And then you start thinking about the other people and all that. A couple of hours later, the people came over and said, he, he wasn't on it. I said, what, what do you mean he wasn't on it? You know, he went by them, he come, was come back by them. He said, no, what it was, he said, the police had just thrown anyone on the buses. And when he said, the, the, the fella said he was full, he was full, but not with the people he took. The police just... So then it starts again, panic starts again then. But then you get a thing, you think, Philip was a sensible lad, you know what I mean? He was a sensible 14-year-old lad, he would have been on the phone. I know there's no more about, he would have asked someone, could he use a phone or found somewhere to say he was safe, can he come and pick him up or where he was and all that. Families desperately trying to find out the whereabouts of their loved ones had been faced with an agonising wait. In Sheffield, Jenny Hicks had been searching for her husband Trevor and her daughters, Sarah and Vicky. Eventually a doctor came with a clipboard and he, he just said to me, are you the mother of Victoria Jane Hicks? And he started to describe Vicky. And I said, you're going to tell me she's dead, aren't you? And he said, yes. And I asked if I could see Vicky. And I was told in no uncertain terms that no, I couldn't see her because... Um, she was property of the coroner of South Yorkshire. So I'd just been told that my daughter was dead and then I was told that she was no longer my property. As if she ever had been property. And eventually Trevor arrived and I just started shouting at him, you know, where's Sarah, where's Sarah, I can't find Sarah. And I, I told him that Vicky was dead. And he said that he knew that he'd been in the ambulance. And then he, he started to tell me his experience and that he'd left Sarah on the pitch. And that the last time he'd seen Sarah, she, she was in a pretty bad way. The sports hall at Hillsborough was now being used as a temporary mortuary for the victims of the disaster. Families now faced the harrowing task of trying to identify their loved ones by studying photographs of the deceased. I was so relieved because I couldn't see Sarah. Which is an awful thing to say because you've looked at all these poor people. But you're relieved because you can't see your daughter on there. And um, I, I, I said to the policeman, she's not there. So he just said, look again, love. Oh, so I looked again, and uh, this time I saw her. And that was the moment uh, we realised that we'd lost them both. They wheeled in these two little low trolleys. Uh, Sarah and Vicky were in body bags on these trolleys. And they opened the body bags and um, I just got down on the floor. And um, when they opened the bags up, obviously I could see it was Sarah and Vicky and uh, picked Sarah up and gave her a hug. And I can remember being really surprised because she was still warm. And I asked them why Sarah was still warm. And um, I don't think I got an answer, really. Their worst fears realised, insult would now follow injury for the bereaved parents. We gave statements um, several times. We went over the incidents of the day. And we were interviewed as if we were criminals. What time did we leave home? What was the traffic light on the motorway? Had we stopped for any alcohol? What had we had to drink that day? It just all seemed to be about alcohol, um, which we hadn't had any. And eventually, um, we were told we could go home.
In Liverpool, many families were still waiting for news of their loved ones. 14-year-old Philip Hammond had still not returned home. I'd seen a policeman walking down the path, so I just stood up and I thought, oh. So I opened the door and I said, don't tell me he's dead. He said, oh, no, 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 he's not dead. He, we found some um, clothes of his. You've got to ring this number. And he just gave me a piece of paper and then walked away. And I thought, I'd say, I turned down and said, got the f next thing I see my brother coming with my younger brother and their wives. And I said, look, we've got to go back. Um, they found some of his clothes, you know. And my brother said, no, he, he said, said Phil, he's dead. And I said, no, he, said, he just told me, look. They found, he said, no, I, I've identified him dead. And that was it, you know, just, poor, Just, um, unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. The families now needed time to grieve, but the press would not make it easy for them. The press started to arrive. It must have been about lunchtime-ish on the Sunday. The phone didn't stop ringing. People braid on the door one after another. And really, we didn't want to talk to anybody or do anything. We just wanted to be left alone. There must have been about 15, 20 um, newspaper reporters, cameras all outside the house. Um, going round the back of the house, you know, trying to get um, not, trying to get pictures inside your house and all that. One Sunday paper just walked in with two of his friends, believe it or not, and when he came to the door, we just thought it was boyfriend of one of the two girls, which, until he came to the front room and said, is that Phil, can I have a photograph of him? That's what you have to contend with when you, you, you just lost your son. The media circus was to sink to new depths in the days that followed. That was, that was outrageous, some of the things they were saying. But that didn't, it didn't divide them. It just brought them closer together. I was there. I saw what was going on. I saw no pilfering. All I saw was a load of football fans pulling their fingers out, trying to save people, you know, when, it, when the establishment, the police control had lost the plot. And, you know, it, it really did um, cut to the quick that the, people, the very people who tried to help us were being accused of being thieves and vagabonds, basically, and worse. We went to visit the hospitals in, in Sheffield uh, to see the, the supporters that were, that were in the hospital and, and some of the families that were there. In some areas, you went into rooms where people were were lucky enough to have survived, and you got their kind of minute-by-minute minute account of, of what had happened and and stuff like that. You went into other rooms where there was people who just looked asleep with the families and um, obviously in comas and stuff like that. And um, like the family would say, you know, they'd love it if you spoke to them and said something, but I'm sure um, the majority of, of players did. I was asking how many of these people are going to come out uh, of, of calm. We said, well, bit by bit, you know, it's, it's good, it's, it's OK. And there's a young lad there, he said, um, would you go over and say a few words in his ear? And I went over and, and I spoke to him in his ear and I said, John Aldridge, you know, when, you know, when, you, when you're up and you, you come to Anfield next time, you know, I'll give you this year, you know, we'll make a, we'll make a fuss here, you know, and we'll have a great day. And, and I acknowledged his family who was around him and then I went back to the doctor and uh, I said, uh, so when do you expect the young lad to, to come out of his coma? And they're switching his life support machine off this afternoon. Creased me, absolute. Ripped me, ripped me inside out. The only bright spark on that day was that one kid come out of a coma, which was unbelievable. When, when the lads were around the bed, the kid woke up. Things like that were, were great, but there, was, there wasn't many, unfortunately. Liverpool Football Club opened its doors to the public so a shattered community could pay their respects. When he started putting the, the flowers on the pitch, I mean, it was just it was, it was unbelievable. The amount of people that wanted to come and do that. And people who wanted to get in the cop and lay their little memento uh, because it was their mate or something that died. That was, was unbelievable. 
There was something to be seen. It covered probably half the pitch and on the cop. We put the flowers where we, we knew Sarah and Vicky used to stand. And we were sitting on the cop and um, this Salvation Army person came up to us and said, are you a bereaved family? And we said, yes, we lost our daughters. They said, oh, there's a room you can go to and have some tea or just take a rest or some privacy or what, what, whatever. All the football team's wives were there, basically running a dropping centre for want of a better description. So we were taken in and Marina Dalgleish, in fact, took us on board. And we talked about the girls, we talked about the love of football, and it helped enormously. The atmosphere within the, the, the ground and with the families was fantastic. The wife serving them tea and some of the lads that came about the football club, they came up just to help if they needed any help. Uh, and it become like a, somewhere for them to gather. We make sure someday we love the connections would be at every funeral. And I think the families really respected that. I mean, the boys weren't the obtrusive in any way. They sat back and they let the family go on with the grieving. But they were there, the presence was there, and uh, they didn't need to have anybody coming up and telling them how grateful they were for them to be there. They were there because they wanted to be there. The funerals, you know, the, the, the first one, it was a young lad, uh, me and Barnes, he went to, then, you know, there was the, the, the girls, the two girls, the extra girls, and there was, the, there was the brothers from Natalie, and and then there was, a, it was the, the son uh, and, and his dad, and it just kept on growing and growing and growing and growing, and whew, that was hard, man. That was really hard for, for everyone. Hillsborough ultimately cost the lives of 96 people. In the weeks that followed, the Home Office ordered an inquiry. Just why did this disaster happen? Immediately after the Hillsborough disaster, the Home Office set up an inquiry under Lord Justice Taylor. Its remit was to inquire into the events at Hillsborough and to make recommendations about the needs of crowd control and safety at sports events. The year before the disaster, Liverpool had played Nottingham Forest in another FA Cup semi-final. The match was also played at Hillsborough. The fixture went off without incident, but for some, the warning signs were already there. The year before when I scored the goal, I seen, I seen the scenes on on the television afterwards, the end was chocker. Absolutely chocker block. Why the hell didn't the Liverpool fans have, have the big end? You know, we had massive support. There was a complaint in 88 after that semi final. Liverpool actually said that there, was, there could be serious problems and repercussions, you know. Lord Justice Taylor's findings stated that the main reason for the disaster was the failure of police control. Taylor said that Chief Superintendent Duckenfield froze. Duckenfield later admitted himself that he had lied about certain statements regarding the causes of the disaster. The report suggested that it would have been better to delay the kickoff, as had been done previously at other venues and matches. Then the easy thing to do is just to put the kickoff back a bit. That's no problem f for anybody. Um, if the police are talking to the, the FA, now if we have got to make that call, there wouldn't have been any resentment or disagreement for the people in the dressing room, neither Brian Clough, God rest him, or, or, or ourselves, certainly. The Taylor report also stated that the immediate cause of the disaster was the failure to cut off access to the central pens once Gate C had been opened. This was, said Taylor, a blunder of the first magnitude a reasonably competent commander would have opened the gates after they made precautions. For instance, the inner yard, 
They could have held people in the yard. All of them could have come round the sides. The sides were relatively empty and the centre was already jam-packed full. It was so simple, they should have closed the tunnel. If they closed the tunnel when they opened the outer gates to let the extra supporters in an extra 2,000 people in, who went straight down the tunnel into already overcrowded pens, we wouldn't have had this disaster. Lord Justice Taylor, I think, got it right. And bear in mind, he was a football fan as well as the Lord Chief Justice. He said that the fundamental cause of Hillsborough was loss of police control on the day. And I concur with that fully. There is no way they didn't know that that crowd was in distress. I'll never accept that. Taylor's report recommended that all fences should be taken down and that all stadiums at the highest level of the game in England should become all seated. The events at Hillsborough must never happen again. After an inquest lasting 90 days, the longest in British history, relatives were hoping for a verdict of unlawful killing, yet the jury returned a verdict of accidental death. Many are still seeking justice for the people that died. So the day you died, you, you've, got to, you've got to get answers, you've got to keep on banging whatever drums in front of you to keep on going, and, and because it should never have happened. It's as easy as that. You go on a, a lovely April day to watch the semi-final of the FA Cup, you know, and, and your loved ones don't come home. I'll tell you what, if it happened to my son, I'd, be, I'd still be, I'd be unearthing whatever I can to find out some, some answers, yeah, big time. Football died that day in a in, in, in certain way. Football has been new. You look at the stadium now, which is fantastic, you know, great and all that. But football, as we knew, in that generation just stopped. And then we've got a different type of football now. I think there's a whole generational gap. It's 20 years. I mean, that means there are 18, 19, 17-year-old kids who haven't got a clue, really. They know about it because it's folklore. It's part of our history. They don't really know. They don't really know what, what we went through that day and what we go through all our lives and what I will always go through. I'll always see them images, I'll always see them faces. Just to love your son, that drove you on. You know, you wanted to uh, get to the bottom of this, you know. But people have told me, my wife's told me, strangers have told me, you know, Phil will always be able to look down and say, my dad done his, done his utmost to get them 96 people of justice. Everything points to a policing mistake, that's all. But yet everybody wants to blame the, the fans. But nobody's ever held up their hand and said, no, I'm sorry, I was to blame. Nobody has. People haven't been held accountable and, you know, possibly shielded from the families, from, you know, people seeking the, the, the truth. Um, so I'm not so sure that we ever will have closure, unfortunately. I can't have what I wanted. I wanted grandkids, I wanted the girls to do well, have a good marriage, um, and we can't have that. And we will never be able to have that 20 years on, 40 years on, or 100 years on. This will be the 20th year where I've sat around a table at um, Christmas time, birthday times, anniversaries, and my son hasn't been sitting there. I try to be as positive as possible, otherwise I just couldn't live. I have to be positive and um, one day at a time, basically. I actually think I get help from, from my daughters as well. I think the love that we had helps me cope. In fact, I'm sure it does. Uh, 
I mean, it's something that everybody wished had never happened. Um, but I think it's also something that nobody should forget. <laughs> <laughs>